Good evening. It is my pleasure to call the Peoria Public Schools Board of Education meeting for March 8, 2021 to order. Madam Secretary, would you please call the roll? Mrs. Kostick? Mr. Kloss? Here. Dr. Ranking? Here. Mr. Walter? Here. Mr. Wilson? Here. Mrs. Ross? Here. President Shaw? Here. We have seven present. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Vice President Wilson, would you like to start announcements, please? I would, thank you. Meal distribution for to-go meals will still be available to all PPS families every Tuesday and Thursday from 10 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. at Richwood's Manual in Peoria High. In addition, the Salvation Army delivery truck has also partnered with Peoria Public Schools to have 12 drop-off sites throughout the city every Tuesday and Thursday. For a list of sites and drop-off times, check the, check the district website or Facebook page. Thank you, Vice President Wilson. Ms. Kostick. Thank you. Daylight savings time. Daylight savings time begins Sunday, March 14th. Remember to set your clocks forward one hour. That's on Sunday, March the 14th. Tutoring. Peoria Public Schools offers free tut <coughs> tutoring to all students, both in person and online. Please contact your principal for information. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Kostick. Dr. Ranking. Five Essential Surveys. Parents and teachers, please take 10 minutes to complete the Five Essential Survey. The survey window closes on Friday, April 2nd. The Five, five Essential Survey is a valuable to, tool to allow families and staff to provide feedback on their schools. Thank you, Dr. Ranking. Mrs. Ross. Those who excel, the 2021 Those Who Excel. Uh, 2021 Those Who Excel nomination forms and information on the application process is now online, www.peoriapublicschools.org slash those who excel. The nomination deadline is Friday, March 19th. Thank you, Mrs. Ross. Mr. Klaus? Summer School, Peoria Public Schools will offer summer school to all students this summer. K-8 through students will go from June 7th to July 15th while the time frame for high school students varies by grade level. Parents will receive enrollment forms in April after spring break. Thank you, Mr. Klaus. Mr. Walden. This on. <clears throat> with the reopening of Peoria Riverfront Museum, PPS families with students in grades K through eight can take advantage of free admission with the Student and Family Fund Pass. The pass can be used an unlimited number of times until May 2nd and is for every PPS family regardless of size. In addition, families who travel to the museum on CityLink can show the driver their pass for free round trip transportation to the museum. The pass includes admission to a free full length or educational giant screen movie with popcorn, a free planetarium show and free visits to any exhibition in its permanent collection including a new exhibit of Preston Jackson's Bronzeville to Harlem in an American Story. Students who complete all three museum experiences by May 2nd, watch a movie, explore an exhibit, and see a planetarium show will win two passes to see T-Rex, the Ultimate Predator, an internationally acclaimed exhibition opening May 29th. The T-Rex, the Ultimate Predator, sponsored by SEFCU, travels directly from its creator, the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Thank you, Mr. Walder. And I have two. First, I would like to uh, thank the thank Charter Oak for the billboard, I mean, the bulletin board on my left, and Manual for the bulletin board on my right. Uh, 
First announcement, National, school, National Social, school Social Work Week. At the start of National School Social Work Week, we would like to thank our school social workers in Peoria Public Schools for all that they do for our children, families, and staff. And the balanced calendar surveys, the second balanced calendar survey from the district's balanced calendar committee will be sent out to our families and staff later this week. Please take a few minutes to fill out this, uh, to fill this out in order to provide feedback to the balanced calendar committee. Okay, moving on to our community contribution. We have Principal Suggs. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm gonna have my admin team come on up. Um, that would be Mr. Matt Durr, um, Ms. Amanda Brown, and one of our new assistant principals coming aboard with us is Ms. Leticia Clemens. So we're going to have them come up. And also, we're going to have our Jack and Jill Foundation of America come forward as well. OK. So I just want to take time out to say I am super excited about why we're here tonight. Um, we've been working extremely hard to get a marquee for our building at Glen Oak. So I'm thankful to the board, to our wonderful superintendent, Dr. Karat, my ED, Dr. Woods, I don't think I see her in here, but all of my support team and staff and everyone, Mr. Willis and everyone has worked so hard to help us with all the different contributions. This is just one of them tonight. It has been many and several. Um, earlier part of the year, real quick, um, I was meeting with my PTO team and they was like, hey, we need to, we've been working for years, several years to get a marquee. I said, working for several years? I said, we need this up now. We, I, I said, my community, we can't wait and they deserve the best. I said, and some of our parents, unfortunately they move sometimes, numbers change. I get a lot of bounce backs when I'm sending out sky alerts sometimes and it makes it difficult. So I just think this is gonna be an added benefit for our community and I'm so excited about it. Um, quick update, it is in production. It's supposed to be here by the end of the month. So looks like we're on our way to being able to better communicate with our parents so they can just ride by because we are a community school and most of our students, they walk to school. So it's not like we have a lot of bus riders. They're walking in the community, in and throughout the community. So this is gonna be certainly an added benefit. So I'm solely accept, excited about it. I don't wanna prolong the time. I've been working directly with Ms. Mimi. I'm gonna let her come so she can kinda um, introduce her team as well. Yeah. Oh, uh, I'm Mimi Bolmar, um, and I'm the president of our local Jack and Jill chapter. And this is Jaden Hawkins, uh, the vice president of our team group. Uh, and we were just thrilled. We had um, a work day and we were, um, educated a little bit about some of the challenges that the wonderful team at Glen Oak was having, trying to stay in communication um, with their parents. And for those of you that don't know, Jack and Jill is a leadership group run by mothers, um, supporting, we support our own children and we support all efforts to make the lives of you know, all children better. And so when we heard about the challenges um, and this really excellent effort, we did what Jack and Jill does. Jaden and we uh, issued a challenge and asked our mothers, let's see if we can't help these parents. We know acutely how important uh, the ability to communicate with your school, communicate with your community and know what's going on, particularly in this time of COVID. So our mothers and our team were deeply moved. So in a pretty short amount of time, we were able to come up with, um, you know, uh, a donation that we're gonna make on behalf of Jack and Jill and our mothers to Glen Oak Schools in the amount of $5,500. So, I know, I know that doesn't get you all the way over the finish line, but we thought, you know, we're really excited about the effort to get you a little bit closer. So, we're gonna do a quick shot, if you don't mind. But we're really excited, and in general, I should say, we deeply, deeply support the work that Peoria Public Schools does. Um, we know how hard you guys work. Um, to take care of the community, and we are really happy to be part of that. So, 
much thank you so much thank you thank you principal Sugg, and thank you to uh, jack and jill it is a great organization definitely thank you uh, let's see. okay moving on we have a food service update we have mr streamer good evening i'd like to thank uh um, president shaw Dr. Crott, the Board of Education, for giving us the opportunity to, uh, giving me the opportunity to speak before you and tell you about what's going on in Peoria Public Schools Food Services. Closer to. All right, so I do have a presentation. Um, Peoria Public Schools in Sodexo uh, have uh, been in partnership and running the food services department since 2012. It's a little different organizational chart though. Having 150 of our staff in the schools being Peoria Public Schools staff. Mike McKenzie, Gabby Klein, and Mick Willis are what we call our clients. They're the individuals for the district that we report to, that we work with closely um, on a daily basis. Our Cinexo team, there are three managers, myself, Robin Ekstam, Doug Simmons, our chef, and we have two admins. At the high school level, there are three production managers that support at least seven or eight other schools. They're feeder schools. Those feeder schools are who you see out in the, uh, all the non-high schools each day, uh, managing their staff, um, ordering, receiving, producing, serving. It's where the rubber meets the road every day in Peoria Public Schools. This next slide represents growth in meals served year over year. Um, and we attained this uh, well over a million meals some years ago. The reason I'm showing you this now, kind of at the beginning of the presentation, is this is the reason we have been able to support change program improvement, enhancing our facilities, and I'll refer to this um, as we move through the uh, presentation. COVID-19, we know it and love it well, don't we? We received recognition from the uh, state superintendent early on. Uh, we had served about 21,000 meals um, supporting our community. I think by June we had reached about half a million, and I did a little rough figuring last week, we're about 850 million, or 850,000, excuse me, uh, meals served so far. Um, these are non-congregate meals. This is something brand new that the USDA has done really for the first time, where we can feed families at home. They can take the meals from the schools. And uh, as uh, Mr. Wilson was saying, we actually have partnered with the Salvation Army. Uh, we do summer business with them as well. And they are, we've, I can update uh, the slide that was just given or the presentation that was just given by Mr. Wilson. We now have 13 sites that they're delivering. We, had, we added Harrison Homes just yesterday. Food safety and, and 
physical safety are very important to us, all of our staff. Um, we do training every month for both food safety and physical safety here in Peoria. This was one of the, um, we were told by our clients that this was one of the areas that separated us from our, com our, uh, our competitors, um, the training and, and the programs that we have. We also do weekly and monthly food safety and physical safety audits. That's done by the kitchen managers and the production managers in their buildings. Additionally, myself, uh, Chef Doug, Robin Ekstam go out and do annual inspections. And then something that is very different, um, I think for, for most school districts, for most companies, is we hire a third party inspection um, uh, company, EcoSure. They are professionally trained with uh, um, both the uh, OSHA, FDA, and Sodexo standards. Uh, they come out once a year and they're actually in the area and we probably will be seeing them very soon in the coming days and weeks. The, we see year over year sanitation and cleanliness improvements within the district. Um, some of it just annual training and, and improvements um, year to year, but also with our new renovations providing new modern facilities for our kitchens, for our kitchen managers, our schools, um, really has helped make that easier and possible. As a result, we've, run, we've won uh, many awards um, of excellence from the Peoria Health Department. Um, and that is not easy to do. Uh, there are new criteria. They have changed their inspection procedures. And it's pretty tough and yet we still have many schools that are able to attain that each year. The safety program that we utilize is called HACCP, Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points. It really encompasses the entire process of uh, producing the food, um, purchasing it, storing it, preparing it, and, and right through giving it to the uh, the children in the schools. It is the standard in the industry and it is an ongoing training for our, uh, for our, our kitchen managers, our head cooks, bakers, assistant bakers, what have you. And then as well, Peoria Public Schools uh, has in-house uh, food handler training. Now this is something that uh, often isn't done. We have to hire somebody to do it. But Jerry Haar and Gabby Klein, um, our Peoria High School production manager and our assistant uh, food service director, have been certified by the state. So we do that internally throughout the year as needed with our food, with our food staff. And then food safety and quality are, if there's ever any incidents, anything brought to our attention, um, we have a process for investigating. And HACCP gives us the tools to do that. Everything that is done within food service is documented. All of those safety steps that we have in place, whether it be a simple, something as simple as uh, recording the refrigerator and freezer temperatures each morning, or making sure that our sanitizer strength is correct. Um, all that documentation helps us zero in on any possible, if there was something that was brought to our attention, how could it have happened? Um, and we're able to trace through that system because of that documentation. Peoria Public Schools um, and Sodexo are forming a, I'll call it a community or, or a parent advisory committee. This is something that is supported by the USDA. Um, we're already starting that list of individuals who would like to be on our advisory committee. This is just a listing of the types of folks including our board members, who can be a part of that, uh, that forum, and student board members as well. We hope to have that up and running um, in the month of March, and that, that forum will help decide what are the, the goals that we're looking for in the coming year. It will also decide the frequency of those board meetings. It is kind of a normal progression to meet monthly, change it to bi-monthly. It could even at some point become a, a uh, semi-annual 
um, meeting. But we're looking forward to working with the community. This supports the district's um, commitment to um, community engagement um, in, in encompassing bringing the community into what we do. This is something that Food Services has been doing for years, and I'll, uh, I'll refer to that as we move forward. I am very pleased to announce in the month of March, we have already started many schools uh, utilizing a more normal, what we're calling full service menu in the cafeterias. So we've got full, all the kids in the buildings, we're able to use our cafeterias, and they're coming through and being able, being able to get hot food um, and be able to select whether they would like, uh, looking at March 8th, the chicken nuggets, a turkey any timer, or peanut butter and jelly or sun butter and jelly, which is available at each school. That picture down below, I believe is at Harrison K-8 school, and Fabian Daniels, Principal Daniels, was actually the first person that I called when we were figuring out how to do this. And I could tell you she was just excited of having the opportunity um, to work with me and to, to get this going. She, it was a question, I wanted to bounce off her some ideas, and she just grabbed it and said, yes, we'll make it happen, we'll figure it out. And we've got most of the schools that are doing the full service menu or a hybrid um, thereof, um, allowing the kids to have more choice in, uh, in their meals. So I referred to that well over a million meals that we have increased serving annually. 900,000 of that came from grab and go breakfast in the classroom. This has been a great way to support our student learning. Um, we work closely with the ISBE and Midwest Dairy Association, No Kid Hungry, as we have in pretty much all of the programs that we have started. Um, but this has been a huge success here in Peoria. This also was a huge success. This was a first um, in this area. Um, we got a lot of support from the ISBE. Matter of fact, we had a meeting after we started our after school um, dinner program, P3, Peoria Power Pack. Um, we had a meeting here with the ISBE, No Kid Hungry, Share Our Strength, just to talk about how did it work, how did we make it be successful. And the reason they wanted to have that meeting is they wanted to learn as much about what we did as they can so that they can replicate that and support other districts in putting in programs like this. Right now we're doing about 50,000 meals a year supporting those kids' uh, achievement after school. This has been a big one and probably where most of the dollars generated from increasing our, our meals served here in Peoria Public Schools have gone. We have renovated uh, or I would say just converted satellite kitchens where the food was made at a high school and shipped in. They're now making it themselves on site. So instead of being cooked off at seven, eight in the morning, we're cooking it off just before um, lunch starts. This was our, uh, our Franklin team. Um, and the guy in the back was actually the trainer. This was the first day they were being trained on how to use that equipment. Um, we've done a lot. Uh, the district has spent literally millions of dollars on commercial equipment for even the schools that are still satellited. Um, we've got a half a dozen that we still have yet to do, um, but we're moving forward. Additionally, we've done uh, renovation of the Peoria High School um, kitchen. We are about to renovate uh, the steam line where we've got our jacketed kettles and convection steamers over at Richwoods. Um, we've put in uh, new walk-in freezers because of the extra volume. We need more space to store food. Um, that's already done at Manual and Richwoods and we're about to do uh, in the planning process for, for Peoria High as well. This is uh, our, our future chef program. It's a, just a super event that is done each year. Um, unfortunately, on Friday the 13th of March uh, 2020, um, we got the news that everything was changing. Our old normal was gone and our new normal moved in. And this 
this event was actually scheduled for the next day. We had to cancel it. Everything was ready. Um, this year it became a virtual event and I'm assuming, I'm hoping and praying that it will come back next year. This program evolved where it was our, originally our kitchen managers and their staff who helped the kids on the day of the competition. With the addition of the Peoria Public Schools Culinary Department, culinary program, um, we now have the culinary kids are the sous chefs for the little kids each year. Um, we've had many board members come in and be the judge for this, as well as district administration, and uh, we are looking forward to, uh, to having this again this coming school year. I talked about the, the pillar, the value uh, for Peoria Public Schools in reaching out to the community, community engagement, um, working with the community. This is how we grew the Peoria Public Schools summer meal program. Uh, the first year I was here, I think they did about, we did about 3,500 meals. We do about 65,000 meals now during the school year. Um, and I, I am in error. I noticed today I left out the YMCA. They are a big partner. They're there for us year-round um, with after-school programs and the summer school. So I have to apologize for not putting them on this slide. Snackademics. This is the first district that I've worked with, and I've worked in three different states, um, that had parent university, that had the parents come in and help educate and, and, and support them as they support their students. Um, we've been doing snackademics, which is nutrition, wellness um, events, more than I can count. Um, but we now utilize our Bradley Dietetic Interns. I'm the preceptor for the Bradley program, and this it becomes a project for them, first semester and second semester, to uh, put on a nutrition um, and wellness training for the uh, parent university attendees, and it is extremely well um, uh, attended, probably because we have food. A to Z salad bar. Um, we've gotten grants pro probably totaling uh, something over 100,000 from the Midwest Dairy Association. Um, these salad bars are now in all of our buildings where we just had tables we were serving the side dishes off of. We now have full service salad bars. These three were the last, I think, uh, I have a total of 27, I, th I think we've gotten through the Let's Move Salad Bars to Schools grant. And these three are dedicated A to Z salad bars. We literally at these events have all the fruits and vegetables from A to Z. Um, the kids are just wowed by it. We have staff that come up and go, what is that? Um, and I'm the carny hawker at the beginning of the line telling the kids, try something you haven't had before. You could find something you'll love for the rest of your life. And then lastly, sustainability. This is our newest effort. Um, it started out with uh, placing single stream recycling um, at almost every school in the district. I think Knox is the only one that we can't find a spot for. But Keller, we were just about to start, I think within a week or so of the advent of COVID, um, a composting pilot focused on the little kindergartners. Um, we worked with um, um, Becca from the county and uh, Luke Rosenbaum from um, Good Earth Composting. Um, this is all ready to go. Now that we're back in the buildings, we can look at restarting this. We worked with the PTO over at um, um, Keller, uh, including Dr. Christy, uh, I have to have trouble with her name, Thernos, um, helped spearhead this from the, from the, uh, um, the PTO side. Um, this is, we targeted the, the little kids and what the plan is. It's kindergartners next, this year. It's kindergarten first the following year. It's kindergarten first and second. As they move through, those habits are there and we perpetuate it. We went and did a, a road trip over to Bloomington and talked to some other folks, and, and that is a stepping stone, stone process that works to uh, make it sustainable and, uh, and year over year um, attainable.
Thank you very much. As I said, I'm, I'm always happy to have the opportunity to speak with all of you. Are there any questions? Questions from board members? Uh, Vice President Wilson. I just had a quick question. When did you say the, uh, the uh, community advisory committee, when would that be uh, implemented? Like, I'm hoping started? within the month of March, before the spring break, if not soon after that. And do you have like a number of uh, parents that you wanted to see on this committee? I don't have any, um, any ideas on how it's going to end up being comprised. Um, we will start soliciting um, for that um, with our district communications um, and build that team. Right now we've got some folks that have uh, uh, requested to be on it. I think I've got two or three folks. Um, a normal size, I would say, would be maybe a dozen people. A dozen parents. Well, it, again, parents or staff, district administration, myself and my chef. Um, but we'll see how it works out here in Peoria Public Schools. There's no set um, number or uh, um, that's that's given by the USDA. Student board members. Yes, student board members as well. Would that mean monthly then, I'm assuming? In my mind, I think that would be something during that learning, um, kind of center, get the synergy going, I would say monthly would probably be necessary, and we'll see where it goes from there. Thank you. Other questions from board members? Mr. Walden. <clears throat> Have we worked out the hot lunch agenda now that kids are back? Um, as far as we have, um, the hot lunch menu is now in place. In most schools, in some schools, they're having some difficulty working the log logistics. So we're doing some hybrids to figure out how to make that happen, but we're finding a way in the buildings to do this. Yeah, some of the schools I visited, you're doing alternate days, is that correct? You're doing some Right, days we've got some middle hot. schools that are doing some alternate days. We've got some, we, we've got, we're, we're finding whether by hook or crook, a way to make it happen. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. We are ready for presentations by audience, and I would remind the audience that presentations are limited to five minutes. We ask. President Show, we have one more. Oh, we have some oh, school. Did I miss that? Oh, I yes, missed sir. a presentation. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, hold on. Let me back up. I know. I wish we were. <laughs> I wish we were there. <laughs> we do have one additional district presentation on summer school, so. Yeah. Yes. And she will be brief, actually. Dr. Bot. And Dr. Bott is the um, director of, Dr. Bott? Yes. Can you introduce yourself, please? Yes, I am um, HR recruiter and equity officer. Um, good evening. Thank you, President Shaw, Dr. Karat, and members of the board. Today, I would like to present to you our summer school 2021 programming for all Peoria Public Schools, 150 students. We have utilized and reviewed past summer programming, practices, current research, to focus our vision on three specific criteria. These include focus on student engagement through personalization and choice, intense scientific research-based practices and programs to leverage this summer and to continue into the fall, and maximization of teachers' expertise in a robust way for maximum impact on providing students with optimal learning gains. For the summer programming, a student's day is organized differently from a typical classroom schedule in order to maximize the time with teachers' expertise and student engagement. Let me start with a few logistics for kindergarten through eighth grade students. Parents will be able to select three weeks session one and or three weeks of session two. Transportation will be provided to the following sites with summer school programming. Maud Sanders, Charter Oak, Sterling, 
Glen Oak, Harrison. Students from all over the district will attend one of those sites. We will also have ESY at Jameson and Thomas Jefferson. Can you tell them what ESY stands for? Extended school year for specific students that uh, is part of their IEP process. For our high school students, grades ninth grade, summer program will take place at each high school from June 1st to June 24th. Focusing on in-person for math, science, social studies, and English. Also, there will be virtual learning options as well. For 10th and 12th graders, Knoxville will provide virtual ingenuity courses with supports by staff for course completion. In addition, we will be continuing with our summer program for incoming ninth graders, Wenning, to prepare our ninth graders for success um, as a ninth grader, freshman on track, core classes, and NCAA qualification standards. Let me tell you a little bit about how the program will be structured in K-8. Like I said earlier, it is very different from a regular classroom. So if a site had 150 students, we would look at those students' levels of learning, <coughs> where they're, they're at, and group the students in grade bands of 25, with about 25 students working in a learning pod uh, with two facilitators to facilitate their structure for the day, provide some small group independent work, as well as some STEM theme activities. In addition, those 25 students will be supported with a literacy content facilitator, a math content facilitator, and opportunities for mini courses. In addition, every site will have a site supervisor, our learning clinician. The role of the learning clinician will be to look at each individual student's learning profile, look at the data that we have on each student in their academic achievement, and to determine an action program for literacy and math for every student. Here's an example of a student's schedule. So as you can see, the day is broken up into about six sections. Um, students arrive at 8.30, they eat breakfast, uh, at 8.45, they may start with their first mini course opportunity. At 9.45, they would transition into a literacy intervention. At 10.45, they would do some group work, uh, independent work, a STEM activity, followed by lunch. Another mini course from 12.15 to 1.15, math intervention, and close for the day. Our program will be staffed with certified as well as non-certified staff. We're also looking to provide nursing support uh, to schools in anticipation that we would continue with some testing um, pieces in the summer. The unique part of our program is really our curriculum and supports intervention. So we're looking at providing STEAM focus throughout the week. We are considering purchasing Fontes and Pinnell level literacy interventions that focus on small group, group instruction with engaging level books that is a systematic, systemic approach to the reading and writing process for students to accelerate learning. The district will be looking to purchase this program as well as provide professional development for the literacy content facilitators. For math, we'll be focusing on strengthening math strands. Students have the greatest need and the math practices recommended by the National Center for Intense Intervention. We'll continue to use the online resources we have purchased, such as Lexia, Dreambox, and IXL in moderation. Our focus is really to provide individualized supports by an adult to our students. Math content facilitators will also receive professional development. I spoke of mini courses earlier. 
So many courses are really an opportunity for students to get some of the fine arts that they've been missing out on, as well as opportunities from our partners in our community to come into our schools and provide some enriching experiences. The thought is that the mini courses would last um, anywhere from 60 minutes to 90 minutes or 120 minutes, but the mini course would extend for one week. And last is our timeline of our process for the summer. We're gonna be getting ready to uh, do some hiring. The principals have already begun speaking with teachers about the summer school programming and getting their input and feedback. And so our next part is to um, post our positions. In April will be our enrollment kickoff, communication to families, and our curriculum development. Thank you. Dr. Bott, you referred to uh, nurses and testing a few slides back. You're referring to COVID testing? Yes. Okay, okay. Other questions from board members? <clears throat> Mr. Waller? I just appreciate you making the presentation. It, it helps for us to know what you're gonna be doing in the summer and stuff, so uh, thanks again for Very this. welcome, thank yeah. you for the opportunity. We usually don't, but Mr. Walter, because we've had such disruption and um, we thought it would be a good idea to share with the board the unique framework that we will experiment with this year. And kudos to Dr. Bott. She's relatively new with us. She's worked collaboratively with the principals and Dr. Wilson, Dr. Bell, Dr. Wood, Ms. Rose, and the entire team. They've all worked together to create this beautiful framework. and. Um, we've only just begun because, you know, there needs to be a recruitment committee and we're hoping, you know, one of the things uh, I'm hoping is that our families take advantage of it um, because it's, it's going to be very, very, very good. So thank you, Dr. Bott and the rest of the team for putting a nice framework together for Pierre Public Schools. Mrs. Ross. I just had a quick question. Um, will there be a referral component? Yes, ma'am, a recruitment. So we did talk about every building would be in charge of um, oh, recruiting. Find the kids that yep. need and make a referral. And we actually have all of that. They have all of that. So having conversations with families to encourage them to really take advantage of the opportunity because it does, it fits in perfectly with our disruptive learning framework, which is another framework. Dr. B, <laughs> Dr. Bot left. Oh, oh you're right here. Okay. She says she's shy, but. <laughs> um, so we're looking at principals already beginning the work of identifying students that would really benefit from summer school. But our summer programming is set up so that all children can participate. But we will be targeting students that are in the greatest need as well. Thank you. Any other input from board members? Thank you. Now we are ready for public <laughs> comments. And uh, again, I remind you they are limited to five minutes and we ask that you keep the comments constructive. constructive. Our first, first presenter is Ms. Jan Lindsay. Good evening, everyone, and thank you. Uh, I'd like to recognize Dr. Karat for an outstanding job that she's doing as well as the board. And I'm not here to complain, I'm here to support. Um, but there is a situation that I've faced three times already uh, this year in reference to children being dismissed from school due to a headache. These children take the medication for the ADHD and the ADD. These are common side effects of a headache. Uh, we've been out 20 days already because one student complained of a headache. Another, actually 30 days, another student complained of a headache. He was, they were sent home. And a child who has some levels of manipulation issues uh, when they can't have their way, go to school and say, I have a headache. And we're out again for another 10 days. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the strap, the, the rapid testing is not uh, 
within hours, it's 24 to 72 hours, and that's what's, what we're facing right now. Um, I did get a call back from uh, the doctor's office, but again, it's still uh, 24 to 72 hours before we can get them back in. I have four boys that are out of school, not one student. All, all three of my children's schools were contacted. My children were sent home. That in, that's very, it's very disruptive. Um, so what I'm asking is, can, is, is it some way that there can be something put in, in place where more than one symptom, or even if a doctor can have, uh, we can have a notice from our doctors to take to the school principals that they can have something on file stating that if a child that is taking these meds can be some, some type of excuse for them to still stay in school or do they have to go home? Um, and one other thing, in the event if they do send the children home, that they're prepared, that they have their laptops, that they have their devices before they're dismissed. And that's all I ask. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Mike Murphy. Good evening. I want to start by thanking you, President Shaw, uh, Vice President Wilson, the rest of the Board of Education, and Dr. Karat, uh, for allowing me some time this evening to uh, share some exciting information about an initiative in place um, to better the drinking water situation at our schools. Um, first, my name is Mike Murphy. I'm the PTO president at Keller Primary School. Um, I'm also one of the two people that has uh, enlisted to be on Mark's team for the food um, committee. And um, I live on uh, 422 East High Point Drive here in Peoria. I currently have three children who attend Keller Primary. Um, and I've been a, a parent volunteer at Keller for the last three years. And, um, I've had extensive involvement at all K through fourth grade schools um, since I'm the president of Look It's My Book. Um, but tonight I wanted to tell you about the water bottle filler initiative that I started. Um, this is to cover um, costs putting in um, new water bottle filler stations at all of our public schools. Um, the Peoria Federation of Teachers brought to light the need for filtered water and I reached out to them to let them know about this initiative which they were thankful for. Um, I've worked with the administration to get me a list of the schools that do not currently have these hands-free water bill, uh, bottle filler stations. It's Mark Bills, Calvin Coolidge, Charter Oak, Franklin, Harrison, Jameson, Thomas Jefferson, Lincoln, Northmore, Sterling, Valeska Hinton, Whittier, Dr. Maud Sanders, and Roosevelt are the 14 schools that still need these water bottle filler stations. The community has already started supporting this initiative and to date we have secured sponsors to pay for um, stations at four of our buildings. Other donations have been coming in daily since our new, uh, news coverage on Saturday. The cost is $750 um, and that's per fountain and I'm asking that the public email me at uh, mjmurphy82 at yahoo.com to get information about where they can send their donations. Businesses or individuals who want to sponsor a fountain in its entirety will receive a special plaque above a fountain. I know how effective these fountains are firsthand. Last summer I was part of a team that secured four of these for primary, uh, Keller Primary. The staff and students have benefited, uh, benefited greatly uh, being able to refill bottles throughout the day. These will be sustainable options for us as we move forward and they will be continued safety measures even once COVID restrictions have been lifted as these are hands-free options for the kids to get water. Any extra monies raised over the requested $10,500 for this initiative will go towards more fountains at the schools. Uh, we've had requests for at least two at Tree Wind by teacher and I know others that would benefit from even more than that. This is an effort um, the community can be a part of to help make our schools better during this return to person learning as well as during um, the new robust summer learning program and summer school. Um, these will be wonderful additions for them to have during the summer as well. And again, I want to thank you for allowing me the time to tell you about this initiative. Do you have any questions about the initiative? Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next, we have Mr. John Kelly.
Um, <clears throat> my name is John Kelly. I'm on the Peoria City Council. Uh, I'm an at-large member of the City Council. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak. I'd like to particularly thank uh, Mr. Willis for coaching me along on, in this process. Uh, I'm here to speak, uh, as I spoke the last time at the uh, Peoria Public School board meeting, that was the last time was 35 years ago. But interestingly enough, it was the same topic. Uh, that evening, I spoke about <clears throat> the school district uh, cooperating with a city uh, initiative for our enterprise zone and uh, to allow tax abatement in our enterprise zone. So, <clears throat> and the school district did uh, 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 cooperate and the uh, tax abatement in the enterprise zone was extremely successful. Uh, so uh, I'm back on almost the same topic, tax abatement. We have a residential tax abatement program uh, that we are, are considering. Uh, uh, I, I have uh, given you all, I think, a handout I'll be speaking off of the uh, outline, but I included a, a lot of extra info uh, in back of that uh, to perhaps fill in the gaps. So, tax abatement. Uh, what is it? Well, it is a no-cost tax forgiveness program for new, newly constructed single-family, owner-occupied homes in challenged neighborhoods. This is based on a state statute that we're employing. In Peoria, we want to do this in the North Valley, in Averyville, and on the far south side that is west of Western Avenue. All taxing bodies are automatically included in this. Um, it's important to note that the tax abatement or tax forgiveness will only be on new construction. All the uh, buildings that currently exist there and all the land continues to be taxable. Um, but if this is successful, uh, those land values, which are now extremely low, will probably rise. And as they rise, that's taxable. So that even during the, the granting of tax abatement, uh, the school district and all the other taxing bodies realize an increase in revenues coming out of uh, these areas. Uh, the city and the county are going to take their increase that comes off land value increases, if any, and roll that money back into these areas and pay for people who are having their taxes abated on their, on their home that they, that they own there, uh, part of their state income tax, making this even more attractive uh, to people. Um, the abatement period is 10 years. Uh, it's a 100% abatement for the first six years, and then it drops off, and after 10 years are up, that new structure is completely taxable. Uh, the banks are going to administer the uh, income tax rebates uh, under their uh, Community Reinvestment Act requirements. Now, tax abatement has worked, every, general tax abatement, that is, has worked everywhere it's ever been tried. We have tried to find an example of it not working, and we can't. But a couple examples of where it did work. In Philadelphia, they started it in the year 2000. Uh, by uh, March of 2019, no, March of 2017, home building 
in Philadelphia rose 376%. And 25%, am I, is my five minutes up? Yes. Uh, Can you, we let him extend for a few minutes? I was, I was gonna say it's, it is up to the consensus of the board. Okay. Okay, that's two. All right. Every, please. You give me more time to talk, it's your funeral, you know. But, but I appreciate it, thank you. Um, and in Philadelphia, 25% of the new homes built were in challenged neighborhoods. In Akron, Ohio, 2014, there was one new building permit for a new home in the whole city of Akron. Two years later, with tax abatement, there were over 1,000. And in Peoria, as I mentioned before, we had tax abatement in our enterprise zone. That was commercial industrial, but building permits there went up 42%. The dollar value of the permits was up tenfold. Now, what are the potential downsides of tax abatement? Well, if the program fails completely, the school district and all the other taxing bodies are in the same place they are now, with declining revenues coming out of these neighborhoods and all the problems therewith, okay? The other side of the downside might be that if it's very, very successful right away. And if it's very successful right away, you're going to see a lot of population moving into those areas. There'll be more and more school age kids and you folks are gonna to have to figure out what to do with them. Either uh, expand the buildings you have, build new buildings in those neighborhoods, uh, uh, re restart some of the buildings that uh, you're no longer using. Um, but these are, these are nice problems to have. Um, that's all I have. And uh, please, uh, if you have questions, my name and phone number is on the back of, of your last page. And I would be very, very happy to answer any questions or have any discussions about this. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. The, the, uh, I just have one, uh, one recommendation that boards, board members contact you if you would reply to the entire group. We can't, we can't respond to as a group because of the Open Meetings Act, but yes. the questions that board members may have would probably be uh, good for you to respond to all of us if you could do that. That would, that would be perfectly fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have Mr. Jeffrey Atkins Dutro. Good evening, Jeff Atkins Dutro, president of the Peoria Federation of Teachers. Uh, we brought up several issues at the last meeting, uh, two that were going well, stepped up vaccines and COVID testing. Several issues we were told were not in our purview, lunches, water, return to school plans, limited testing, slash student tiering and retreat metrics. It sounds like we will have a summer school, although we would say that after this pandemic, we should maximize teacher student learning as opposed to virtual. And we do now have each school's return to school plan. We have started a social media campaign with regards to lunches. We want hot, healthy lunches, not just lunches that aren't moldy. Water, with the water fountains off, we want bottles of water for our students and the fountains Mr. Murphy referred to. And with over testing, and I'm talking about academic testing, I'm gonna spend a little time on this. We have had a call to do away with the manifold electronic programs, testing and otherwise. And what we're in is an era of the commodification of education. This is where for-profit companies descend upon districts to sell their wares. They sell assessments and prep students meant to slightly boost achievement on tests. Their goal is not to dramatically increase student achievement, but to dramatically increase their profits. Our district for the past couple decades has fallen victim to this cycle. 
for-profit companies make millions of dollars off of us. If you talk to someone in the pocket of these companies, someone two or three times removed from the classroom, you'll hear that we can't live without these programs. If you talk to an expert in the classroom, you'll find these programs are getting in the way of quality instruction amid the limited time we have to instruct during this pandemic and even outside of the pandemic. This is our plea to the Board of Education. Let us teach. Another issue that keeps popping up is social distancing. I think the Board of Education has the idea that our classrooms are spaced out and that we have plexiglass dividers where students cannot be divided by six feet. That is often what is portrayed in the media. It is our hope that the Board of Education will understand that we have classrooms that are packed and we have heard stories about packed buses as well. Teachers will be largely vaccinated, so I want to be clear that whereas it is our job to look out for teacher safety, of greater concern with teachers always is the safety of our students. We have asked teachers in packed classrooms to notify their principals, and if no action is taken, to notify us, at which time we'll go to the administration and to the board. As I conclude, I want to take a minute to give a public shout out to our members who have worked doubly hard to keep the train on the tracks during this pandemic, and I'm sure they'd love to hear the same from you. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker is Mr. Terry Knapp. I'd like to continue where I left off last time. Uh, I gave you the last two meetings a page with all kinds of schools across the country, a variety of states that have tried this balanced calendar uh, and has not worked, okay? I have seven more pages here. I chose not to, it's more of the same. It's uh, you know another 20 states across the United States that have tried this and it hasn't worked. I, I also have a, a phone number I'd like for you to uh, write down if you have a piece of paper in front of you. It's 309-793-5200. Hopefully you got a pencil. I see they're all moving up and down very rapidly. Slow down. Papers are catching on fire there. Uh, that is the phone number for the Milan Rock Island School District. Uh, last meeting, Ms. Wilson, uh, I was talking about the Milan School District. She, she in, inferred, I thought, either she doesn't know that the Rock Island School District and the Milan School District are the same district, or she's not informing you of that. All you have to do, if you're interested, is call their office and they will tell you they have an eight week summer school, excuse me, a summer vacation, an eight week summer vacation. Not a three week, an eight week. And I keep hearing Ms. Wilson infer that they have a three week uh, summer school vacation. They have told me time and time again, two years ago, I presented this to the board. I presented all this material I've given you to the board two years ago, and they conveniently misplaced it. It's not around. And it's rather irrehensible to me that, that we cannot report to the Board of Education what's really going on here. They don't have that program and have repeatedly over the last three years told in the media that they that's where we got this program oh go we took a bus to rock island to discover this not happening call them up you have the phone number call them up please do that last meeting uh miss caustic suggested we rush then renaming of the schools through. Let's say rename all five or six of them now. Let's not take our time and look at this. People in Peoria don't like the cancel culture going on in this country, let alone this city. Rename the schools without names, Charter Oak, Sterling, Rolling Acres, and others before you name schools for the outstanding people of this country that started this country, George Washington, 
Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln. Are you kidding me? You can't really believe this and be educated. You can't have been educated in this country and try to cancel culture these people without even renaming schools that don't have names. It's so obvious what you're doing, it's sad. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Knapp. We have a oh, oh, response to audience presentations. Dr. Karan. Thank you, sir. Um, just quickly, Ms. Lindsay, I think she left. Um, she had the little one with her. Um, but I'll give her a call. I, um, I appreciated her comments. And actually, Mr. Brooke and Josh and I, <laughs> the entire weekend, <laughs> were responding to similar, um, you know, similar frustration from our families. And I had one parent and you know, every I said, team, can we can we do something about this? Because it makes sense, and I like her points. She has really, really good points. Um, but it's we have to follow the IDPA process and the CDC and actually health departments process. And sometimes it's a little it seems confusing, and it has to do with the release. Whether it's seven day, I mean, ten days, seven days. You need a doctor's note and so forth. And what I'll do is actually, Mr. Brooke has done a really nice job. But seriously, I mean, for the, throughout the entire weekend, we were just working with families, explaining, getting them to you know, understand. Sometimes they see one part of the sentence and you know, just get really excited and, and happy about it. But um, still, they're still sort of confused about why this kid is still being kept on quarantine when, you know, the example she gave me, the kid had three COVID tests, um, a release from the doctor, right, Mr. B? You wanna take it from there? Um, I mean, at, that was similar to uh, similar to what Ms. Lindsay said, or a parent that came with uh, a baby. I think Ms. Lindsay's was a little bit more around the symptoms exclusion and uh, that the, the student had a headache. Um, and yeah, so but, they were excluded it's, because it's, of the headache. It's yeah. still, yeah, it's yep. still the protocol as yep, well. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And there, and you know, there's a little more wiggle room on some as far as you know, testing negative for a symptom, um, and we do our best. And I think, I think when we follow up with Miss Lindsay, we'll have some solutions for her. But uh, I don't, I don't blame any parent or anyone that's confused about the process. That there, you could probably. Um, you could probably include a, a, a almost a novel's length worth of guidance and recommendations and if this then that um, when it comes to this stuff so that's why we're here to walk people through it and we want to get kids back when they're when it's safe uh, when uh, as we're following that that public health guidance um, and that's that's what we're we're working with our families on for sure that's all I have president show okay thank you vice president Wilson um, I just wanted to say um, Thank you to Mike Murphy for taking that initiative and, uh, you know, with the filtered water. Um, so I will be emailing you as well. Is it mjmurphy82 at gmail.com? At Yahoo? Yeah. Okay. So I'm glad I asked. So thank you. Yeah. This is Kostic. Um, in reference to Mr. Knapp, I, the, uh, I, I think you took that wrong. What I was stating was the fact that we put all six schools on that particular proposal, not rushing them through so that we do not have to, every time we go in to rename a school, we'd have to put it on um, the agenda. So that's all that was doing. It wasn't stating that we're going to put them all on there and rush through them. So. Um, if that's what you thought, then you were wrong. I would say you should do one at a time. It point. is one at a time. It is one. It, it will be one at a time, sir. That's what that was indicative of. Okay. We have an item, um, approval of minutes for the October 26, 2020. Is there a motion to approve? Second. 
It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? <clears throat> Seeing none, please call the roll. Mrs. Costick? Aye. Mr. Claus? Aye. Dr. Rankin? Aye. Mr. Walther? Aye. Mr. Wilson? Aye. Mrs. Ross? Aye. President Shaw? Aye. We have seven ayes. Motion carries. Thank you. We have a return to school plan update. Dr. Karat? Yeah, thank you, President Ross. Uh, President Shaw, I will be very, very brief. Um, just to give you a quick update regarding March 1st, um, which was uh, the in-person five days a week return. Uh, principals and staff celebrated last week uh, the return of students to in-person for five days a week. And uh, staff spent two weeks preparing with uh, safety in mind and worked through all of the logistics. I was really, really, really amazed and impressed. And actually, all of their work um, exceeded my expectations, and that included administrator, administrators as well as teachers working together collaborati collabor collaboratively um, in their building to um, make it possible for the kids to come back safely for the five days. And um, because of that, their planning played off, paid off and uh, students and staff are so very happy to be back in person. And um, where minor adjustments were needed, they were made. And so the parents have been really enthusiastic, um, as well as the staff, uh, with the various safety protocols around drop-off and pick-up pick up as well. Um, and you heard from uh, Mr. Streamer today, um, in terms of the cafeteria and the progress that they're, they're doing, offering hot lunches, and uh, students are really excited about that, and principals have done a really nice job ensuring the safety, because it does take a lot of work, a lot of planning um, to get all of those things done in terms of even having marked spots on the cafeteria tables and you know, uh, in the cafeteria itself to provide the distancing that's needed during lunch. Um, I would say a big win for us. We've seen an increase in attendance, and we have seen an increase in student performance. I think uh, maybe a, a week ago when I sent you guys the attendance for A day, B day, and so forth, there was 5,000, 5,000, 5,000. All of last week, it was like in the 8,000s and higher. Not include, and of, of course, of a virtual school, which is still our largest school. Um, continues to maintain their attendance, 1,643 students. So um, you can tell that the super majority of our families and actually staff do want the kids back in person. Um, it was a great week last week and uh, continues to be a great week there. And uh, if there are any, obviously we talked about the elasticity and we were provided CDC, you know, there, you know the, the, the six, the six feet, but that was ideal, um, and uh, classrooms have provided for the three feet we talked about previously. Um, and so, yep, that's just a quick update regarding return to school. Really excited about the the, the work that uh, our administrators have done, and of course, our teachers are doing an amazing job. And I'll tell you, the super majority of them that I've heard from, they're happy to be back and. They want their kids back and they're thrilled. And kids are, we've seen students are improving academically as well. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Dr. Karat, Dr. Rankin? Yep. Um, so one of the things um, that was asked last time, um, and I'm going to be honest, I don't think we have received it. It doesn't sound like the union has received it. Are the retreat metrics? We asked for the specific retreat metrics for um, for students and or staff, I know that we had gotten an email tonight from you about that, but is there something specific about this, is specifically what the retreat metrics are for each of the schools? Yeah, and uh, that was that's in the return to school plan, and we, you and I met on Friday. I, you, if you need anything, I okay. I ask you to let me know. So that is all part of the, you know, the, um, the return to school plan. I don't know, Thomas, if you want to add anything to that, or Josh, but it's, stated in there okay. it's stated in there mr brick book the year yeah and the retreat will will definitely center around either um 
you know, if the staffing levels, if those, uh, if those fall below a certain um, number that we cannot uh, continue with in-person um, instruction. Also, um, depending on the classroom, uh, if there's a, the, the metric we've been using, which is from the uh, ISB, is uh, the five cases over a 14-day period. Um, and that would prompt a, a classroom to, to go all remote for um, an extended period of time. And then, but, but in all likelihood, it wouldn't take five in order to, you know, close contacts, exposures through contact tracing would probably um, close that classroom far, uh, far before that. Um, and there are other considerations, you know, it, staffing is a big one, depending on the type of program uh, that might, it, it might not be five, it could be two or three. Uh, depending on the situation, or if it's a smaller class, and therefore more positives mean a little. So, so that's, there are standards, but it depends. Yes, exactly, <laughs> okay. exactly. Yep, yep. Like, okay. like we like we say in a lot of different things, it's not a one size fits all approach, but it is rooted in in safety, but also the guidance we've been given, uh, either from our local health department or from the state. Okay. Um, the other question I have is around assessments. I know that we had spoken about this last time that we had a meeting, and I know that President Biden came out with federal requirements for students to do assessments. However, um, in curiosity, which assessments do we currently have that are uh, mandated and which ones are not mandated that we might be able to not do this year? Because I don't believe all of our assessments are mandated through that federal guidance. Yep, so primarily, thank you, um, thanks for that question. The one that's mandated is the one that's actually occurring this week, and at least they can start, you know, that's the state standardized <laughs> testing, uh, because all of our funding, a large majority of funding are associated with that. And then, of course, we have the, um, you know, the COGAT, um, which is to determine, um, you know, part of the criteria for Washington um, for fourth graders, so we have that. Um, so I don't think we want to get rid of that. And then um, we have the MAP testing, um, which is NWA, and uh, that's very, very important because remember the state testing, <laughs> it has no value to us whatsoever. The primary purpose of that test is to compare schools. Um, you know, low performing, exemplary, that sort of thing, but that's, that's whereas MAP, um, NWA, it, we're able to determine where kids are, find out their strengths, their weaknesses, and so forth. So um, accountability is, 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 you know, um, from the state, you know, state standpoint, it's, it's important and I get it, but I think we're all on the same page as far as the state, the state testing, state standardized testing. There, to me, there's no value for that one, but we have to do it. Um, the other one, um, because of the huge disruption with COVID and our move towards a more personalized <laughs> education for our children, more focused on skills, um, we have to have an idea of where they are in order to do the work. So that's that. That's that. Those are the two that, uh, you want to add anything, guys? Am I forgetting any other assessments? The uh, PSAT. Oh, yeah. Is that the kids' assessment? Correct. Okay. Yes, yep. yes. So we have notified our kindergarten teachers that they need to collect whatever they can through whatever means that they can. So that's also required at this time. I mean, we're doing the best that we can. It's not, it's not exceedingly uh, excruciating. I mean, we can make it work, and we're making it work. Um, and you know, the majority of the test, the only one that we're using them because we, it serves a purpose to determine you're kind of like a doctor, you come in and you temperature check, your blood pressure, cholesterol, whatever. So that's what MAP does for us. Um, and the other ones are all mandated by the state and we've, we've figured out a way, figured out a way to get it done. 
Other questions on the return to school plan? Seeing none. Proposed expenditures over 2,500 questions for Mr. Willis. Seeing none. Report of request under the Freedom of Information Act and the status of such requests, Dr. Pratt. Thank you, President Shaw. Since our last board meeting noted on February 22nd, we received zero um, request and there were also zero pending request um, um, on that date, February 22nd. Um, as of today, since January 1st, we have received 11 requests for this calendar year at a cost of $550. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Karat. We are now ready for the consent agenda. Vice President Wilson. Yes, President Shaw. The consent agenda consists of the following items. Item one, gifts to school district. Two, payment for travel. Three, human resource report. Four, approval of Panorama Social and Emotional Learning Student Success Pilot Project. Five, Woodruff Career Technical Center Project. Six, approval of 2020-2021 school calendar. And that is the entirety of the consent agenda. Thank you, Vice President Wilson. I will pull item six. Are there any other items that board members want pulled for a separate vote? Is there a motion uh, to approve the consent agenda with the exception of item six? Sorry. Discussion on the consent agenda in its entirety with the exception of item six? This is wrong. Question. I think this question would probably be for Mr. Willis. Um, it's uh, item number five, uh, Woodruff Career and Technical Center project. I understand that. Um, when did when did those bid? How many bids did we get in on that particular project? If you can remember right out there. Uh, two. Just just two. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this came in last. Other discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Mrs. Costick? Aye. Mr. Kloss? Aye. Dr. Rankin? Aye. Mr. Walther? Aye. Mr. Wilson? Aye. Mrs. Ross? Aye. President Shaw? Aye. Seven ayes. Motion carries. Thank you. I pulled item six. It looks like a typo. Is it 2021? It'd be 21-22? Yeah. So if we could amend that to say 21-22. Is there, is there, well, I would like to amend this to, to change it to 21-22. Okay. A second. Okay. I had a question about oh, number okay. six, go ahead. too. But, okay, but okay, I, go ahead. I, that well, was one of the two things. I okay, well, that's good. And then, oh. Okay, mine says 2021. 20, yeah, mine does too. The subject. Oh, on the agenda. I was like, on the actual calendar. Oh, okay. On the actual agenda. This is the motion. Yeah. The motion. Okay, so I just had a question. What is the actual starting date next year? That wasn't in here, and it wasn't in the uh, addendum that we had in our packet. So, what okay, I thought I saw that in there. In the, uh, in the yeah, because they had the there. There's the Valeska and right. KCSS, which is on the on the balance, and right. then the the school district is on the, the regular. Right, but when is that starting? What is that date? Oops. Mr. Walter, it's yeah, it's August 18th for students and August 16th okay. for staff. Okay, yeah. that's what I just want to clarify. Okay, okay, good. we're good. Okay, so uh, it's been moved and seconded to accept item six. Uh, item six as amended. It's, oh, more discussion. Yes, Dr. Rankin. Yeah. Uh, so on the last page, so we have um, the Val Valeska Hinton one, um, which is the first one. The second one is for. Most of the schools. Oh, and then the last one is for Knoxville. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. Other discussion? Please call the roll. Mrs. Costa? Aye. Mr. Claus? Aye. Dr. Rankin? Aye. Mr. Walker? Aye. Mr. Wilson? Aye. Mrs. Ross? Aye. President Shaw? Aye. Seven ayes. Motion carries. Okay, there is Thank no you, President Shaw. Oh, oh definitely. Uh, there is no deliberation agenda, presentations and suggestions by board members. Mr. Walden, then yeah. Mrs. Ross. Okay. Yeah, I have a request. Um, could we have our uh, financial wizards uh, take a look and give a response to the board on the tax abatement that was presented by that so we could get some direction from you folks and where we're at from that. Not tonight, but maybe by the next board meeting. Yeah, we did, Miss. we did. I, I read the part in there, I just thought that there were some other questions yeah. and stuff we had on that. That's all we had because there were limited information, but I'll turn it over to uh, But I thought there Chief. was some information you didn't have and I didn't know if he had gotten that to you. Yeah, we've, we've been asking for it for years now, but. Thank you, that's what I was wondering. I knew I'd gotten the blurb from Dr. Karat, but I just wondered if you'd gotten that data, that data back and stuff with it. Um, there were two other suggestions that I had, and I, I'm gonna do this in more of a formal presentation at the next board meeting. Um, I would suggest that we, have, that we have a meeting that's between the board and the principals. Um, that has not been done, I think, for a real long time. The same thing, we used to in the past have a meeting that was between the school board and um, the PFT, and I would suggest that we do that too. I write that up in a formal thing so it's presented at the next board meeting and we can do more of a discussion on it at, the, at that time. Okay, and Mrs. Ross? Uh, if I could dovetail on the, uh, on the issue of uh, the tax abatement, that, that particular program has been presented to the south side and your north side. Um, and I'm, I, I agree with you, there's, there's really no, no way of assessing what, um, you know, what the benefit would be to, to the school district and or to the neighborhood, because our neighborhood had the, pre the same presentation. You know, so anyway, I want to just comment on that. But um, as it relates to, um, as it relates to suggestions, um, <coughs> While I realize that, um, the, that the board needs updates, I, I, I would suggest, which is what we did in the past, that board members, uh, that Dr. Grant make, um, make it available for board members to meet with her, as we have done over the years with all superintendents, where we are updated and are able to speak intelligently about what's going on at the district. Um, so we could have special meetings once a month or however many times. I mean, some of us just meet once a month. But um, rather than, you know, um, basically rather than board members um, asking staff for information, we can have the information from the superintendent. And that was also established in our minutes. It, it will say that it was established as an agreement that any documents that we need or want, really it should be the majority of the board that's going to use those documents for board purposes and that those requests should come through the superintendent. So I would like to have us look at the, the history and then um, set up those, uh, 
set up those um, initiatives where we we uh, we request whatever we need from the superintendent, and if it's something that the board actually needs to do their job, then that should be board and all board members uh, get the information. So that's my my uh, request. Thank you, Mrs. Ross. Other comments, uh, Dr. Ranking. Um, I would like to um, formally suggest I will um, work with Mr. Walther to make it something at the next board meeting, but to discuss placing board um, members on negotiation teams. Um, I know that that has, um, at one time it was, um, it has fallen off within the board pre um, purview to be on negotiation teams um, or bargaining teams, um, depending on kind of where we're at. but it has become apparent as a new board member that um, that, that might be something to consider again um, as we are moving forward. So I'd like to suggest that. Other presentations and suggestions from board members? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Um, we've got board committee. Oh, <laughs> oh man, I'm just. I'm anxious too, okay. <laughs> President okay. Shaw. I'm with you on that. <laughs> Reports from board committees. <laughs> Mr. Just two things. We've got um, March 18th. Um, we are having a building and grounds committee, and that's one day before my 39th birthday. So uh, we're going to do that. And the second thing is, I just wanted to restate um, for Mrs. Kostick, what she stated was not to rush everything through, but to take these buildings one at a time. That was her intent, and that was what we had agreed upon at the last Building and Grounds Committee meeting. So uh, when Mr. Knapp said that, I agree with you, Ms. Kostick. I, that was not my understanding for what you said that either. So I just wanted to restate that for the record that she was, that that's what the committee has recommended that we take these one at a time. So I just want to be clear. So that's it. Thank you. Other committees? Uh, Vice President Wilson. Uh, yes, uh, the policy committee will next meet on March 17th at 3.30. Thank you, Vice President Wilson. Other committees? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? Those in favor? Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you.